Now you may remember that we've been studying 1 Corinthians 12 and Paul in that chapter redefines the spiritual gift and he in, enlarges the concept much larger than their small uh, list of just a few spectacular gifts. Now he also does away with any idea that spiritual gifts prove us to be spiritual persons in any unique sense because all of us have spiritual gifts. It's a work of the Spirit, proves God to be gracious. So the question may arise, what would prove one to be a spiritual person? Paul's going to answer it in this chapter by talking about love, the authenticator of the gospel. In other words, character, the character of Christ. Now when we read this, you're going to notice that it has a different style to it. In fact, some commentators argue that it's kind of a polished gem inserted at this point. But you're going to discover that it's a unique composition of Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that has a unique point of argument here that, that, that is very vital to this whole understanding of spiritual gifts. There's a bit of a polemical nature to the chapter. Its importance between chapters 12 and 14 prepare us for understanding why a mature person would prefer gifts that led to the edification of the body. So that's pretty important for us to understand. As you read it, you kind of get the idea of a, a little bit of a wise statement, a wisdom literature. There was a, there was a kind of a literature of the time that's called wisdom literature. And I think Paul chooses to use a similar style because the Corinthians were so proud of their wisdom. They believed they possessed all wisdom. So Paul is actually going to take the argument to their turf using a kind of a wisdom uh, uh, concept to, to present his case. Now, the, the point of this is that love is the only authenticator of spiritual maturity. That is the character of God manifest in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, as you read it, it virtually interrupts the discussion of gifts because spiritual gifts are linked to spiritual persons in their mind. And so this chapter is primarily about persons and only secondarily about gifts. This chapter is a radical redefinition of the spiritual person with love as the only authenticator. Now, Paul will also provide a very pointed correction to the linking of the gifts with overrealized eschatology. That is that they prove we already reign. He's going to correct that in the last part of this chapter. That'll be next week, but this just gives you an overview. Love, by the way, in this chapter, biblical love, is neither emotion nor sentiment. It is love given by the Spirit of God and thus experienced in the cross and becomes the controlling element of all of life. Since love is the sign of the Holy Spirit's presence and the work of the Spirit to conform us to the image of God's Son, we should not be surprised to find that the description of love here is essentially the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, now listen, the Holy Spirit not only provides the gifts for ministry, He produces the character necessary for life in community. Those two ideas are inextricably bound together. The gifts for ministry, the character for life in ministry together. Now Paul will illustrate by using a few of the prized gifts of the spirituals expressed to their nth degree, and that is as much as possible. I had all knowledge, I had all prophecy. Now in each case, any of those devoid of love will declare that person to be a spiritual zero. So let me read the first three verses. Do you have your Bible open? Make sure you get your Bible open and your notebooks. I'm assuming you've already read this chapter, but we'll get some summary here. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am really nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now, you recall that tongues held a prominent, though not exclusive place, as a sign of one's present reign. They were mysterious. They were audible. They commanded great attention in the assembly. We will return to this topic in chapter 14. So what does this mean, the tongues of men and angels? Did Paul believe 
that they spoke with the tongues of angels? Uh, in short, no. If tongues were angelic speech, why would they cease in heaven when it would be most valuable to have that speech? In fact, in chapter 13 and verse 10, he's going to say that when we're in the teleon, when we're in the perfection, uh, tongues will no longer exist. So Paul didn't believe that. It, it is probably simply a shorthand method of saying any language in heaven or on earth, no matter what that language would be, without love, it's still nothing. Now, I would concede that it's possible that some in Corinth may have claimed that their tongues were angelic language. What, what better evidence could one give to present and, and prove their own heavenly status? But no, the answer is no, Paul does not believe that. Now, Paul says that tongues, if they were spoken in this way, uh, would be nothing more if they have no love, would be like a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. It's possible that the words noisy and clanging may allude to sounds that would have been present in pagan worship of that day. Now, if that's accurate, then tongues spoken audibly would have the opposite result of that desired. In other words, they would be anti-evangelistic. We'll have to return to that in chapter 14, but Paul is saying they don't prove your heavenly folks. In fact, they may turn people off the same way those clanging gongs would. We, we don't know that for certain, but it is a possibility, and many commentators believe that is, is an understanding of this. Then he moves to prophecy, mysteries, and knowledge. If I had all the gift of prophecy and all mysteries and all knowledge, uh, there's no specific mention uh, these, th th of specific instances in Corinth other than the fact that uh, We've seen all of these before, and they're closely related because they, they demand revelational knowledge. Prophecy, mysteries, and knowledge all depend upon revelation and some verbal declaration in the assembly. Notice again the emphasis on all, all knowledge, all prophecy. We've already traced several of the problems uh, in Corinth to the claim of special knowledge. In chapter 8, the eating of idol meat, and Paul could say, you don't yet know as you have been known. In other words, you don't yet have all knowledge, so he's going to correct that. Miracle working faith has not been mentioned specifically uh, in, in the way this one is. It, it may echo a claim of the Lord in Matthew 17, 20, faith so as to remove mountains. Some may have been misusing a saying of the Lord to defend their emphasis on sign gifts and their value. You see, it's true, and if you've read the New Testament, you would know that sign gifts were more abundant during the earthly ministry of Jesus and the establishment of the early church than they have been in church history since that time. Now, if we think through this, that's made more understandable when we recall that during Jesus' earthly ministry, the warfare that is normally based in the heavenlies, according to Ephesians 6, 12, was conducted on an earthly stage. But Satan's ultimate defeat was sealed on that earthly platform with the resurrection. So we would understand why we don't see perhaps as many of that sort of sign gift in our day. We do occasionally, and sometimes more frequently than others, hear of supernatural signs occurring most frequently when the gospel is first preached in areas where a verbal or vit written witness has been lacking. Uh, if you've read missionary stories, uh, particularly among Muslims, we talk about they're having visions oftentimes that leads them to a conversion experience where they hear the Word of God. Now, we, we must be careful that we not attempt to tell God what He can or can't do. He's God and we aren't. But Paul would go on to say, even miracle-working faith devoid of love, I'm nothing. In other words, no sign value. Now, one that may have surprised you in this list is if I give my possessions to feed the poor. In fact, there's several translations. Uh, I, I'm reading New American Standard. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now, that's a pretty challenging statement, to say the least. There is nothing in this letter that demonstrates such generosity on their part. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 16, 
later 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul has to remind them continually uh, about their commitment to contribute to the offering for the saints in Jerusalem. Now there's a textual variant in some of the earliest manuscripts that read, give my body to boast rather than burn. Now that would make sense if they were giving it in a boastful way. But you remember the whole letter and the disregard for physical bodies and rules. This may actually be Paul's reference to the fact that they sometimes disregarded their physical body to prove their spirituality. So let me suggest kind of a paraphrase if that were the case. Why you disregard your spiritual bodies or your physical bodies, excuse me, for selfish reasons such as sexual indulgence and you're proud of it. You think it demonstrates your spirituality. Even if I, Paul, would disregard my body for the most noble reasons to benefit others and yet lack love, it is no benefit to me. In other words, my motive is wrong and my motive was to boast of my good works. What Paul is simply saying is that motive must be behind. Our motive for the use of any spiritual gift must be to honor and glorify God and to advance His kingdom. So now Paul moves to this beautiful definition of love, but I want you to notice that it's really actually very specific. It is, it is the contrast with the spiritual's behavior. He begins with two positive statements, so you have your Bibles open. Start listening again in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, Paul begins with the two positive statements, love is patient, love is kind. Both issues concern our relationship to others, neither of which has been evidenced in Corinth. Now there's a list of love is not. Now these are not just categorically drawn from anywhere, they are specifically related to the Corinthian behavior. So let's look at them. Love is not jealous. Jealous is the same Greek word that can be translated zealous. Now zeal can be praiseworthy if it's focused on the kingdom. But their zeal for various wise leaders in chapter 3 had divided the church and demonstrated their spiritual immaturity. They were zealous for gifts, but to prove that they reigned. So in chapter 14, verse 12, Paul is going to say, be zealous for gifts, but zeal should be focused on the edifying gifts to build up the body, not to show your spirituality. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. The Greek word translated brag occurs only here, and it's got a word picture that you might uh, pick up on. It, it's the word puffed up. It, it's like a toad that swells up, you know. Uh, the Corinthians sometimes in their spiritual pride were puffed up. Sometimes we do that in the church. We think we're something because we've accomplished something and we forget that it's the grace of God working in us. So Paul says, no, guys, it's not arrogant. That's particularly pointed because Paul often used that word to depict the Corinthians. They were inflated. They were puffed up over their perceived William, wisdom. They boasted about their freedom from the law and the traditions of the church. They boasted about sexual immorality. In chapter 5, verse 2, a man was living with his stepmother, but he was puffed up. He was arrogant about it. He boasted about it. Love does not act unbecomingly. That same word is used in chapter 7 about an improper behavior toward a virgin. You see, their behavior towards these espoused wives, we, we don't know all the details of that, but Paul would say that, that there would be some improper behavior there. In other words, he's bringing this back to an ethical standard. It also is used concerning their behavior at the Lord's table where they ate and they got drunk and they ignored the needs of those who were poor and came later. It also is going to be used about their gifts in the assembly. They wanted to use them to prove their own spirituality, not to edify the church. But he says love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It is not zealous or jealous of its own. 
Now he goes on to talk about love does not seek its own. Now this is the nerve center of the issue in several places. For example, you remember the idol meat story we talked about? Sometimes they would go to perhaps even a, 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 mar a wedding that had occurred in a, in, a, in a pagan hall and they would partake of that food that had been sacrificed to an idol or sometimes the food was actually sold in the marketplace and they would go buy it because it was on sale. They thought it was cheap, no big deal. Now, in the context of that, what happened was they, they actually offended a weaker brother. And Paul said that, that wouldn't be the case. Love would never seek its own. So when we turn back to some of those chapters, you'll find that Paul's overriding concern, for example, chapter 8, verse 13, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. In other words, he said, I'm not going to seek my own. Chapter 10, he talks about his right as an apostle, and he talks about this way. He says, I'm not going to provoke the Lord to jealousy. He talks about the fact that maybe all things are lawful, etc. And then he goes on to say that, he had certain rights that he gave up, voluntarily laid down for what reason? Not to seek his own, but that their folks in Corinth would be saved and, and, and evangelized and edified. So love doesn't seek its own. By the way, this is going to be the key determining factor when we get to 1 Corinthians 14, how we choose and use gifts. Love is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Well, in chapter 6, we're told about a lawsuit, one believer against the other. Paul asks, why not rather be defrauded? Then he asks in chapter 6, verse 5, is there not one among you wise enough to decide? Boy, does that have a sting to it. You remember, their boast to wisdom. We have all wisdom. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but love rejoices in the truth. Simply stated, Love finds no joy in sin. Again, we go back to that story of that sexual sin that's mentioned in chapter 5. What's made worse there is that they're arrogantly rejoicing in that sin. Paul says, man, love doesn't rejoice in sin. Then he ends with a positive summary of love. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. The word bears has the idea of covering or enduring. Now, Love does not conceal in the sense of ignoring moral wrong, but it seeks to cover it up and heal it. It doesn't give up on a brother. But even after the forgiving, it believes all things. Love chooses to think the best and seek the best in others. Now, it's not naive. It's modeled after God's love that looks beyond our sin and sees our potential. Do you practice that in your fellowship? looking past person's sin to see the potential that's there? Or do we tend to major on those minor issues and expect the worst from everyone? Then he says it hopes all things. When the evidence is in, the facts are confirmed, and the, it's too bad, love hopes better for the future. Aren't you glad that God loved you in Christ that way? Aren't you glad that he looked for your best? And even when you continually failed him, he hoped for the future for you. You know, Paul is trying to set a, a standard for how we live in community. Now, next week, we're going to move through the rest of this chapter to show how the authenticator of love relates to gifts and their value in the community today. You don't want to miss that study. Thank you for being here today. Remember to read ahead next week and, and begin to fill out those study guides so that you're prepared for our time. Let's just pray and thank the Lord for the day. Father, we thank you for your word. It's true, powerful sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, we are convicted by sometimes our lack of love, our not seeing the best in others, our being puffed up, seeking our own. We want our own way about a lot of things. Lord, our style of music, uh, what our seat is in the church, our class, our, we just want our agenda more often than we want to admit. Lord, we want your kingdom and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Stay reading. Stay in there. I know we're getting close to the halfway point and you don't want to get behind. God bless.